Hello, everybody. This is Rosemary Coates at the Reshoring Institute. I'm here today with my guest, Aaron Halfacre, who's the CEO of a company called Motive that's um, involved with real estate supporting manufacturing across America. Uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome, Aaron. How are you doing today? I'm well. Uh, thanks for having me. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. We've been exploring some aspects of real estate and how that supports reshoring over the past couple of months. But Motive is sort of a unique company doing something different from just uh, the other topics that we've talked about. Can you explain a little bit about the company? Sure. Uh, so, so Motive Industrial is a REIT, a real estate investment trust, publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange, our ticker is MDV. And unlike other REITs that are focused on uh, in the industrial space, most of them are focused on distribution or logistics. We are exclusively focused on manufacturing assets uh, within the United States. And so our, what we do is basically partner with um, small, medium, and some larger manufacturers who historically may have had their manufacturing facility on their balance sheet. And they, you know, they're not optimizing their capital, and they want to have more capital for growth. So we will do what is called a sell leaseback. Sell the, they'll sell the property to us. They will maintain it. They will lease it from us. And so in that way, we're supporting manufacturing by owning manufacturing facilities across the United States, but also giving them capital to to redeploy into their business either for more equipment or or growth in, in various capacities. So these are companies, um, you know, as you said, to free up working capital, but also those that don't want to invest in real estate for whatever reason, right? I mean, they might want to move or they may want to expand their facility or something like that. So, th so it may be uh, an interim solution for a few years, something like that. Is that also true? No, it, it's typically not that they're going to move. No. So if you think about a lot of the manufacturer, what we're um, actively buying both uh, uh, ex typically it's an existing property, right? Uh, it's hard to, as you will, spec build uh, a manufacturing facility. It's, e it's easier to speculatively build a warehouse because the construction isn't very hard to do and you, you know, the boxes are all basically the same. But when it comes to a manufacturing facility, it, it can be very bespoke, right? So it's going to have the needs of the manufacturer designed into the building. And so what we tend to find is uh, look for a survivorship bias, because you think about over the last 40 years, how much had gotten offshored. Uh, we're, we are actively acquiring those assets, uh, manufacturers who survived all that. So they have a natural survivorship bias. They are critical components to our US economy, often inf times infrastructure based. And so the decision to go and do a sell to someone like us is realizing that the capital that's embedded in the real estate isn't the highest and best use of their capital on their balance sheet. And in fact, if they were to sell that and rent it back from us, that they would then have this capital freed up to provide growth. That might mean uh, expanding the existing facility. It might mean adding to an, a, creating a second facility. Or oftentimes what we do is we see that they're using that money in terms of M&A opportunities. So they may take that money, buy another small manufacturer, and, and you know and that complements their product offering. Um, and so it's really meant to be. It's, it's a model that exists, you know, pretty prevalently across the United States. You know, we see the sell leaseback model historically in sort of retail space, right? So uh, Walgreens knows that they need to have a lot of locations, but it's not the best use of their, their money to have that real estate on the balance sheet. So they will build it, sell it and then lease it back for 20, 30 years. And so most of our leases are, are, you know, are 20 to 25 years in length. So they are committed to their, their viable manufacturers. And, and this is also true for new. So oftentimes we'll find someone who is wants to build uh, a manufacturing facility or move into an existing building and uh, retrofit it to their needs. We'll be in that situation too. So, so new manufacturing demands as well as the existing demand that's been there for a while. Okay. So can you give us a couple of examples of the kind of buildings you've worked with? What kind of manufacturers are we talking about? Yeah. So we, we're focused um, 
primarily on those that are infrastructure based. And when I say infrastructure based, I mean things that we don't necessarily think you won't find them on Amazon marketplace. You won't think of a consumer discretionary demand whipsaw, uh, whipsaw effect because these are things that are sort of endemic to the national economy. Examples include uh, the guardrails. So if you've ever driven on the interstate, you've got that corrugated sort of metal gar galvanized guardrail that's lining miles and miles and miles. We have the leading manufacturer of that. They have multiple locations across the United States. You know, these are where you take uh, steel, you stamp it, you dip it into cal uh, galvanizing pools, and then you have it available. Uniquely about that, that's something that, you know, a retail investor would never, or a retail consumer would never acquire. It's definitely industrial infrastructure based. And as part of it, you know, if we ever, it doesn't really matter if we have electronic vehicle, uh, EV vehicles or internal combustion engines. If you hit a patch of ice and you're in the Northeast and you slide off the road and hit a guardrail, that guardrail gets damaged. It has to be replaced. So it's sort of a continuously needed uh, item. And the vast majority of the budget that replaces that is the Federal Department of Transportation. So this is something that's really core to the national economy. Another example of manufacturing that we have is Lindsay Precast. They're one of the larger uh, uh, um, precast concrete manufacturers. So they have locations in, in five different states and they're doing, you know, high density storm culverts. They're doing water retention, sort of uh, sewage wall builds. They're doing bank vaults. They're doing uh, burial vaults for the Veterans Administration. The thing about precast concrete, which is different than poured concrete on a site, is that it there's a high degree of engineering involved. You've got rebar in there. You've got a particular structure. But also what's unique about it is it's got a limited shipping distance, right? For instance, yes, you could theoretically build this in a, an overseas location and ship it because the cost might be cheaper to build it there, but the cost to ship it would be astronomical, right? So you're taking a right. two-ton piece of equipment. You might typically only be able to uh, deliver this in a five or 750-mile radius, and so they have locations across. So those are examples. Uh, we also tend to focus on those with skilled trades, so a lot of CNC machining, lathing, um, folk, people who can take metals and then convert them into things um, either for defense or medical or aerospace. Again, sort of critical types of components. Uh, the manufacturers that we focus on are, are, are located throughout the United States, but there is a bias if you think about where locations tend to be. Uh, there is a general bias. So uh, throughout the United States, is there a concentration in one area over the other, or what are you seeing now? Yeah, so there is, um, and part of that is by you think about the history of manufacturing. So you know, if you go back to the earliest days in the start of the, uh, of America, most manufacturing was along a waterway, right? So we would have you know, rivers that we had water power that created grist mills and then led to sewing mills and textile mills, or you might have been near a port. Um, and so um, if you think about the, and think about the history. So you've got the Northeast and the Midwest have all those elements. So you have a history of manufacturing in those spaces. You know, certainly the old industrial towns is what we think of, but industrial throughout that thing was culturally very accepted. And so when you have something that's been accepted, that means the barriers to entry to, to establish manufacturing are, are a little bit lower. They're a little bit more, the workforce is geared towards these types of things. So if you will, the quote unquote rust belt tends to be a, a, a heavy space where you have manufacturing, but you also have it into the Southeast uh, as we saw in the really the last two and a half decades where we've had more manu auto manufacturers, Boeing's got a place in South Carolina, there's a ride of that there. You find less and less of it in the Western United States, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is there's not as much need for it. There's not as much population density outside of the California or the coast of West Coast. So you, the interior, it gets a little bit less. It's also the distance to deliver is a lot further, right? Um, so we, in instances, we have places in Utah, we have places in Colorado, we have places in Texas, so they do exist. But the density tends to be in, in sort of the Midwest, Northeast, as well as the Southeast. And that's really because if you think about uh, conclusivity, not only is it a low barrier to entry to create, but you also have a lot of existing um, uh, property areas that could be used for new manufacturers. So they can go to an existing facility, retool it if it's empty. It's already been, you know, it already has uh, a use case that's for industrial manufacturing, which can be particular given the environmental considerations or, or what you're doing, the labor force. And so uh, that bias tends to exist all the way through. 
Okay. So, um, so the property is located along the traditional industrial corridors. Um, but you know, we're also seeing a development of, uh, industry in, in other areas, uh, low cost areas or high productivity areas, such as Salt Lake City, um, around the Phoenix area. I mean, these are places that are not traditional. Certainly Phoenix is, uh, got the Salt River, but. Uh, yeah. And Colorado River water, but you know there's um, issues there, of course, with water. Um, so you know there are properties that I think and industrial sites that are being developed in non-traditional areas like that too. Is is that what you're seeing in specific markets like that? So so if you look in the broader sense of industrial, yeah, absolutely. So you know um, the advent of of you know the just in time delivery model that really sort of um, a lot of people use predicates the need for a warehouse and a warehouse having last mile or first mile distribution centers are, are a very common theme and because they can be speculative built. So I could go take, you know, th I could take three other partners, you know, and come up with a little bit of bank financing and I go build a warehouse. Right. And then I gotta go find someone to lease it. And then, so not all warehouses are created equal. Obviously, you know, if you're a developer, you want to develop an Amazon one and you'll do it wherever they tell you to do it uh, because it's very lucrative. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. So, you know, where you have major population centers, uh, you're going to have need for industrial, particularly as it relates to distribution, right? So if you are going to be distributing goods on a short the last mile, then you, you can have these uh, effectively throughout the United States, wherever there's enough sufficient population to support the, the the needs of this distribution as it relates to manufacturing i think that is a little bit different um so the spectrum of manufacturing is pretty vast you know you have what we call light assembly which they might take a flex space they put up some tables they have people maybe they're doing some light soldering or maybe they're doing some repackaging all the source components tend to be shipped from somewhere else and they're just really sort of assembling and then repackaging i like and yeah. depending on the name of these a lot of these can be what i call pop-ups if you've ever been to a strip center and you've seen the halloween pop-up store pops up just in september and it goes away in november these are just temporary use spaces now they're not quite that short but a lot of times they're there there's not any infrastructure needed to set them up it's just i need a space and i have people and i get them on a contract basis and they do it so light assembly can happen anywhere without any um sort of uh restrictions on on location the step up from there is you have sort of light manufacturing. So this might be a dedicated long-term manufacturer, but they're doing small things or, you know, and they could be, they could be doing, you know, clothing, they could be doing, you know, consumer goods, they could be doing other things like that. And then you have what is sort of the heavy manufacturing. This is, could be, you know, chassis for automobiles. This could be defense contractors. This could be, a, you know, lots of a gamut of things. I'd say we lean towards the middle and the latter part. So small to, to heavy manufacturing or light to heavy manufacturing, excuse me, no light assembly. Um, and we find that the locations of those can do, are, are dependent on a variety of factors. One is a lot of times where that company started, you know, where they have a bias to be located because you can technically put a manufacturing place anywhere. You don't need a river anymore because we, you know, we don't rely on water power. So we have all the infrastructure we need. It could be in Salt Lake. We own a place out in Dakota uh, in the areas. We have Salt Lake, you have Colorado, we've got um, Arizona. We certainly have that there. So it's really where there's enough demand. And if it's a skilled labor, so if it's like um, increasingly dealing with uh, the semiconductor space and all the ancillary services, you might find those, that, you know, uh, Albuquerque has a large presence there. Phoenix has a large presence there. You know, Salt Lake has one too, uh, which you won't find as much in, in, the, in the old Rust Belt. So I think it really depends on the nature of the manufacturing. But uh, I think every, we look at lo uh, locations throughout the United States. You know, some are afforded to us. We see uh, locations in Canada and Mexico too, and we get the sort of nearshoring thing. But for us, we think there's ample demand uh, just within the domestic shores. So do you do any kind of refurbishment of the buildings or anything like that? Or you just hand them over, you just find them and hand them over and let the manufacturer refit or uh, develop the, the site. Get so what typically, yeah. So what typically <laughs> happens is we're buying an existing facility from a manufacturer. So a lot of times this manufacturer may have had this facility in place, operational 10, 15, 20 years. And they're saying, okay, we want to, we want to monetize this 
And so we will acquire, we'll um, lease it back to them on a 20 year. So that's the most common example. Now, the other examples are uh, you can take someone who says like, we are, we've outgrown our prior space. Our lease is ending. We're picking this new space and we're going to do a brand new sell lease back at this time, right? So maybe they acquired the space and they, or, or they need us to acquire the space and get it retrofitted. So we'll help them in that regard providing capital to them to help, you know, maybe they need to move. For instance, we have one tenant who just recently was able to acquire a hundred ton press from someone else and they needed space to, to incorporate into their facility. So we helped them where they could expand their facility, uh, build onto the tack onto the existing space, move the, the ton, the hundred ton press in there so they could expand their revenue line. So we'll work in a lot of ways like that. So we might say, here's some CapEx, that allows you to expand your existing facility or consolidate into this one facility. The, the, the third rung is you can do what is called a build to suit. So someone says, hey, we really want, we, we want to lit, uh, have a new facility in you know, Minnesota, and this is where we think we'd like to have it. And we've got the plans, you know, but we need capital. So we'll do a build to suit. So it's designed specifically for them. It's not generic or spec built where it's just like it's a box and whoever wants to take it gets it. It's got a purpose. We know who's going to be leasing it at the end. We will do those as well where we'll provide the capital. It gets built. And then once it's built, then we sign a long term lease with the tenant. Okay, got it. All right. So a lot of uh, existing facilities that uh, the manufacturers are already there, they're going to lease it back from you. So it's a financial yeah. tool, essentially, to help with working capital and long-term financial plans by these companies. Absolutely. It is it's very much a financial tool for them. And it's also a service tool, right? So, you know, um, if they do want to expand, uh, depending on where, if they're a small or medium manufacturer, uh, they may not have as you know robust access to capital. You know, as a publicly traded REIT with a credit facility and things like that, our cost of capital needs are different than a lot of smaller companies would be. What, what about the trucking industry? Are you doing anything with truck terminals or investment in, in, in trucking? We, we are not. Uh, we have nothing against it. Uh, we just think our focus is on the manufacturing facilities. You know, they are obviously okay. served by cross dock uh, truck terminals and things like that. And we, we spend a lot of time analyzing, um, you know, which vendors are using, how often they're having deliveries and shipments made, you know, uh, where are they typically, what's the nearest hubs that they're looking at. So we'll do a lot of that when it comes to our underwriting. I think it's a very viable asset class. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, it's an active space. It's just the one that we don't actively acquire investments in. Okay. Yeah. There's some churn in the industry right now. Some, some uh, yellow freight, for example, went out of business yeah. and they're, there's properties available. And so, you know, there's a kind of a turnover there. Well, so what industries are most active now out of out of the manufacturing industries that you're dealing with? Is it more, um, you know, the traditional heavy industry with metalworking and that sort of thing or more lightweight assembly are you seeing or more high tech? Well, I think the rhetoric that we hear out in the marketplace is all high tech, right? So it's either clean tech or semiconductors. And I think that's, you know, the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Act. Those are all great things. Um, you know, there, there's a nat natural defense uh, mindset to add semiconductor back on the U.S. shores. Uh, where those are very large scale facilities, right? You know, we've seen the headlines. These are typically in billions. Uh, and so, you know, having a single fab that was, you know, a billion dollars would not be a, a good form of diversification for a REIT, unless the REIT was, you know, hundred times that size, which we're let, not. So. Let me stop you. Let me stop you there for a minute. Can you explain? Yeah. So this is a question I had earlier. Um, can you explain the difference between the long-term leads and the use of a REIT? Yeah. So a REIT is a uh, is a tax election that the uh, the, REIT, the REIT structure has been around since 1959. Uh, a REIT means that as a corporation, we don't have, we don't pay corporate tax. So if you think about IBM or Intel, they go set, make revenue, they pay a tax on that revenue. And then if they pay you a dividend, you pay another tax, uh, which is typically going to be your personal income tax rate. So as a REIT structure, uh, we do not, on the rents we get collected, we get paid, no, we pay no tax. We're, the requirement is we have to distribute the vast majority of that income, that taxable income to investors in forms of dividends. So it's a dividend producing type of stock. REITs can be publicly traded or not. We are, as I mentioned, on the New York Stock Exchange. And so we are a publicly traded stock that 
is focused exclusively on real estate. In our case, our real estate focus, and there's all types. You can have apartments, you can have office, you can have whatever. Um, we're focused on net lease manufacturing. And, and so we pay a dividend. So that's you know the REIT that we are. And then the net lease sell lease back is the type of lease structure that we utilize. And then manufacturing is the asset class that we utilize that lease, lease structure on. So if someone wants to have you know, thinks, believe strongly like you and I do about reshoring and they believe in the growth in manufacturing, I, um, you could certainly buy an industrial name. Like if you wanted to go buy, you know, a stock, Boeing stock, for example, you could do that. Um, but we're the, I think uniquely the only name uh, for a fact that does just manufacturing. So there are numerous REITs you can acquire that do industrial distribution. You know, Prologis is the most the well most well known and the largest, but there's there's countless others. There's East Group, there's Torino, there's you know, you name it, Plymouth, LXP. But in terms of manufacturing, we're the only space that does it. Okay. All right. So that's helpful uh, to understand a little bit. This is a financial tool that provides dividends, right? So Okay. Yes. Um, there's yeah. a lot of buzz right now about a manufacturing super cycle coming uh, because of the three big acts that are pouring billions of dollars into the economy. So the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which has got the green energy funding, most of it is in that act, the Chips and Science Act, which of course is semiconductors, and the Infrastructure Act, which uh, hopefully will pre uh, repair our roads and bridges so that we can actually move the goods that we're making. Uh, all of these are really important to manufacturing environment so that, so that it can indeed flourish going forward. And as we develop new, new uh, new industries and new approaches to manufacturing in America. Um, are you seeing an upturn in demand as a result of this influx of, of money or not yet? Or what do you see coming? And in, in, in demand in what sense? You mean like in sort of order demand for manufacturers yes. or? Yeah. Um, yes. You know, so, I, yes. I, actually, I think, I, so a couple of things. I think, I think the, the headlines of these acts are, are phenomenal. I think they're very positive. Um, I think there is a large degree of political rhetoric associated with them. Uh, and so we're in an election year, so we have to think about, you know, the sustainability of that. I think they're, they're you know, they're good for the U.S. economy and they're good for, um, so I think they're good for either presidency, depending on who, where we end up. Um, that said, that it could be some changes. Uh, I think the more important benefit of what we see from this, and if you take away any sort of the political element, is that really for for a long, for, in in my opinion at least, it's it's a refreshingly strong motivation to to understand that manufacturing capabilities and uh, having manufacturers in the United States and therefore having a reshoring initiative is valuable to us as a nation, and I don't think. We were having this dialogue to nearly the same extent five years ago. Even though we knew it was important, right. I think people hadn't felt the pain. And I think through the COVID uh, the COVID nineteen crisis, as well as what we're seeing in Ukraine and the geopolitical risk, we have understood that the global just in time delivery model that has been taught, you know, by business schools and by and drummed into every sort of business leader in the space for the last forty years has now realized that it has some caveats. And those caveats mean that, you know, it only works when it works and when it doesn't work, it's kind of, it's kind of troubling. And so I think yeah. that's the best benefit from all these acts. Uh, we buy assets that tend to have a survivorship bias, right? And so to extent that I uh, can find a manufacturer and buy a facility from them, and they've been around through the Volcker era, through the Greenspan, through Bernanke, that's great for me because that means they've survived all the outsourcing They've created a product that's viable. They, their cost of goods sold was still competitive, such that they'd never had to really deal with, a, a, you know, an offshoring threat. And on top of that, now they're getting this headwind. And so, what I think we're seeing in terms of demand, you know, I think there's a lot of temporal noise. So, uh, I think you know, job job demand or, and manufacturing goods maybe are still they're, they're over a little bit of the hump they had from COVID. A lot of the manufacturers we saw were just going gangbusters because everyone was. In, in the absence of knowing if they could get deliveries, over ordering through you know post post COVID, yeah. I think they've worked through a lot of that now. Um, I think the dollars spent 
uh, right now by the government are really cleanly focused on semiconductor in a fast way. There's a lot, some clean tech initiatives going, but the money that I see being spent, and it's, you know, it takes a long time to build things, right? It takes a long time to build a manufacturing facility. It takes a long time to go through the hurdles. I think a lot of it's going on the chip manufacturers. And that makes a lot of sense, as I mentioned before, because that's a natural defense mechanism, right? So if you think about well, most it's, of- it's, that's kind of, yeah, in, in terms of the competitive environment, it's really urgent that we rebuild semiconductor manufacturing capability in the U.S. So that, mm-hmm. I agree with you. I mean, I think that it's urgent. That's what we see going first. And also, you know, there's an awful lot of uh, money out there that has not been distributed yet. So it's my understanding that the federal government funds are going to the state uh, distribution capabilities and the state awards um, projects based on merit within their own state. So there's a lot of, you know, bureaucracy and stuff going on before we're going to actually see the bulk of that money. Uh, So it's sort of out there and coming. But, you know, I wonder if you're seeing any kind of uh, upturn in specific industrial areas or you know, any any particular upter, upturn other than in semiconductors yet? I, I think what we're seeing is we're seeing, because of the increased rhetoric and this wall of money that still has to work its way through the system, that we're seeing demand for manufacturing assets uh, be robust, that people understand that there's a real need to have manufacturing domestically. It's not just you know, a, a couple people on a soapbox. It, there's a real structural demand. If, it, if it's either defense related or just, you know, the sanctity of the yeah. economy, there's demand for it. And so I think that's what uh, is the most interesting about this right now is that people have for the real, first time in a while, and this is hard in, in, in an era where we have uh, bandwidth constraints because they're information overload to get people to actually start to, to, to understand intuitively that the demand for reshoring is is important and it's here to stay, I think is what's notable because it's it's now set into the conscience of, of a lot of investors. And so yes. I think what we're seeing demand and, and dialogue around that, and that will take care and grow uh, mere fruit and, as time goes on. To your point about the dollars haven't been spent and there is a lot of bureaucracy, that's why for us, um, you know, we're comfortable where we're at because we're we're buying assets that have proven themselves to survive when we didn't have any tailwinds and they're only going to do better when we do have tailwinds. And that, ah. you, know, um, you know, and I think, you know, there's, it's still, I think there's going to be, there's some bias. It's good to see that we have receptivity to manufacturing re- coming back to the United States, but there's going to be a bias. There's still going to be NIMBYism that's going to exist. And so some states are going to say, well, we only want clean tech bad, uh, businesses. And so we're only going to fund those. And they're going to get bureaucratic about something that isn't clean tech. Right. And, and so I think that existing places are, could also benefit from funds uh, if they can expand their growth, right? So I think how we though, all these dollars get spent in manufacturing and what types of jobs, we clearly know that in sort of Al as an example, that they have no problem building car manufacturers. But you know, in the Cal- if you try to do that in another state, called West, a particular Western state, it might be very difficult to do that, right? So yeah, I think yeah. the nature of manufacturing is going to still have the what's in my backyard type of thing, and so. Uh, we're focused on those that are key, survivable uh, in any market environment, and that helps sort of create that moat, if you will, around our investment thesis. Terrific. Well, hey, it's been fascinating, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. And uh, we learned a lot about the commercial real estate marketplace. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Pre- appreciate it. Mm-hmm.